moral temperature, a core and hidden reason we love and return to experiences. Why do we love the experiences that we love? For instance, why do so many people love and repeatedly return to the Disneyland park over other theme parks? It can't just be the rides. Why do so many people love certain educational podcasts when other educational podcasts have as equally good information? Why are some workplaces a joy to go to and others a pain? And why do so many comedians that make people laugh fail to build an audience? Why do we really love the experiences we love? The answer to these and many other questions are found in this episode's big idea. It's an abstract but utterly powerful idea that may be one of the most overlooked qualities in understanding why we love and return to experiences. Welcome to Original and Powerful Ideas. My name is Troy Hedu Campbell, and I use a scientific mind, artistic heart approach to capture original and powerful ideas so you can apply them in your own pursuits. I've spent my life understanding the science and theory behind how humans think and behave and applying those ideas artistically and practically as an applied Duke behavioral science PhD, former Disney Imagineer, Oregon professor, and consultant for Nike, Netflix, and many more. Across this podcast, we'll be exploring together original and powerful ideas captured in many different forms that are meant to be new and relevant to you, whether you are a world-class innovator, a scrappy upstart, or just a curious person with some headphones on. Today's episode is on the idea of moral temperature. And this episode is in the form of an interview with my friend, Todd J. Pierce. Dr. Pierce is a leading Disney expert and historian and has originated this powerful way to understand the appeal of many different experiences, including the Disney parks. The Disney parks create an environment that has a a very knowable moral center. And for a certain regular guest, these are very pleasurable experiences that drive them back to the park because they have a feeling about themselves and the world around them. As you said before, the parks create a place where the values are significantly different than that of the outside world. Obviously, this is not doing it for everyone. And the ideas we're not saying that Disney is the only moral temperature that works or it's the best moral temperature. It's just a way to investigate how powerful a well-constructed moral temperature can be. Together, we take this idea, define it, apply it specifically to the Disney parks, and then broadly apply it to help you in your own pursuits to designing or understanding experiences. Whether you are an author writing a story, a teacher creating a class, a leader fostering a company culture, a parent building a home environment, or a Disney Imagineer designing for the parks, there's something original and powerful in the idea of moral temperature for you. I want to introduce Todd J. Pierce, a professor and co-director of the Cal Poly San Luis Obispo Creative Writing Program, a novelist and short fiction writer, and an expert on Disney being the host of the Disney History Institute podcast, and author of many books, including Three Years in Wonderland, and hopefully his next next book will be called What Theme Parks Give Us, which is a series of podcasts he's been doing where he first introduced me to Moral Temperature. Here to talk about this is Todd. Hey, Troy, how's it going? All right, Todd, thank you so much for turning all our conversations at coffee shops and bars into a podcast. You got it. Since this is original and powerful ideas, we always focus on one singular concept to define that idea in many different ways and help people apply it in their own pursuits. So today we're going to be talking about moral temperature, and we're going to talk about it a lot in the context of the Disney parks as a way to illustrate it and then talk about some larger applications. So in your own words, can you describe a little about what moral temperature is and why it is actually a hidden importance to the success of the Disney parks? Yeah. So the Disney parks advertise themselves as being places of thrill or places where you connect with cinematic experience. But one of the things that the Disney parks offer us is a very constant behavioral, ethical, 
experience once you're inside the gates. And this is one of the things that I think drives people back. People don't become annual pass holders and shell out hundreds of dollars a year because they want to be able to go on small world three times a week. Nobody wants that. (laughs) So there are other things that bring us back into this experience. And one of them is that the Disney parks create an environment that has a, a very knowable moral center. And for a certain regular guest, these are very pleasurable experiences that drive them back to the park because they have a feeling about themselves and the world around them. And this feeling is tied to the types of morals and ethics that are in the films that then become the basis for the space around them when they're in the parks. So let's talk about the general idea of moral temperature. Sure. When I was a kid, I had one really easygoing set of grandparents and one maybe less easygoing set of grandparents. You know, maybe that's a common experience for people. There's one you know, relative that maybe has different rules than your home rules. And so this is the idea that certain spaces have unique rules. And this applies to so many different areas of our life. Work might be more competitive than home. Home's probably more inclusive and comforting than the workspace. And that's because the stories that are valued at work in part shape how people act there. And theme parks play into the same type of concept. Theme parks are dressed typically with areas that resemble movie environments. And the elements from those films define the type of morals that are then valued. In Florida, there's a Beauty and the Beast area. The presentation of Belle and things from the movie then place you in the mindset that this is an area that values the type of morality that's in that film, being other people-centered, being true to yourself, being generally helpful, and people respond to that. So you have this example of Mm -hmm. how when there's a fight at the Disney parks, it's usually a bigger deal and is more likely to go viral than if there was a a fight at the Universal parks as an example of the different moral temperatures in the spaces. Yes. So there are fights that break out both at Universal and at Disney, but they're hardly ever news when it happens at Universal. And if you look at the stories that are commemorated at the Universal park, King Kong, Fast and Furious, and so on. These are the types of stories that allow for a type of aggression, even from protagonists. And so there's a different type of moral space that's considered there than there is at the Disney parks. The internet just kind of lights up with activity Mm -hmm. because at the Disney park, this type of uh, behavior is far outside of the moral temperature that's designed into the park. So we've got our home stories, we've got the actions, And then there's also the idea that the space itself is constructed in a way that promotes a certain moral temperature. Yeah. So part of it, I think, is visual. And so you, Troy, being a fan of portals, I think, Uh um, when you enter the castle parks anyways, you move in under a berm. And so a raised piece of earth in Disneyland and at the Magic Kingdom in Florida, there are two tunnels beneath the train station. And so this is a place where once you move beneath them, you can no longer see outside of the park. And so you have a visual disruption. There's a visual barrier put there. So you can only see what is designed around you. You are now in a new space. This is a visual cue or a trigger that suggests that you have left that world outside behind and you are now in a different place that has different rules and different design ethos. Yeah. As you said before, the parks create a place where the values are significantly different than that of the outside world. Yeah. And so for the deeply regular guests, that's one of the things that they return for. This is a very comfortable, pleasurable space. And this allows for a certain type of play or personality shift to happen in people, which I also think is is very pleasurable for many on vacation. Yeah. People unleash their Disney side, right? So this famous, very effective campaign back from the day, kind of having this idea that you're going to come into the park and you're going to get in this version of yourself that works with this moral temperature. That's often what people are coming for. And people are getting that. I've seen families who usually aren't that great together, but when they're in the Disney parks, they are the best version of themselves. Some of the best conversations I've ever had with my friends, because we're just so immersed in that be kind to each other, listen to each other's stories. I have a friend who even with her then boyfriend decided to get married in a line for Matterhorn. Um, mm. they like, we, we belong together, right? They were allowed to be vulnerable and share and be kind with each other in the Obviously, this is not 
doing it for everyone. And the idea is we're not saying that Disney is the only moral temperature that works or it's the best moral temperature, but it's just a way to investigate how powerful a well-constructed moral temperature can be. Right. So maybe one of the things to point out here is there's a number of ways to behaviorally separate yourself from your home environment. You can go to Yosemite or Yellowstone or Grand Canyon. The national parks do that exact same thing. They create a different environment that is uh, distinct from being home. But the Disney parks are a constructed environment, which everything is managed by designers as opposed to by nature, that have a similar effect on certain people, certain, maybe not everyone, but certain people that it can be very powerful for them. We long to go to these different places where it allows us to be a different or better version of ourselves, whether we're going to an athletics class, an amazing creative writing class, hopefully an amazing marketing class, oh, I'm sure, or a sports game where they, we want to have an excuse to be aggressive and yell that a ref has had the wrong, <laughs> has given the, given the wrong call when it's obvious that they're not as a way to bond with everybody. Right. And those examples there, I think you're seeing different environments that model different types of behavior that then communicate to guests what is and what is not acceptable. You go to a game, you can yell at that ref, you can express aggression. The stories of football are about aggression and overpowering another team. Guests then can model that and that's acceptable there. That would be entirely unacceptable if you were to go to a theme park to yell at the people that work there. That That is not okay. But it's the stories that underpin the space that are value there that play out there. All right, I hope you are enjoying this episode. I absolutely love this idea from Todd. But before we get on, I wanted to take a moment and pause to fully define the idea. So I'm going to do that by playing a definition of the idea that I workshop with Todd and recorded with his approval during the interview. Here's that and the broader applications will follow. To put it simply, the stories that exist in any location define its moral temperature, a set of ethics and behaviors that people should adopt when they are in that space. These stories come from the home stories that are popular, the history and heritage, as well as the actions we observe in the people around us in the spaces, from leaders to guests to employees. Finally, the moral temperature is shaped by the space itself the design choices, and how that affects us consciously and unconsciously. Together, through the overlapping forces of story, action, and space, a moral temperature is created. And on a sort of mundane side, one of the moral temperatures I like is a great coffee shop. I know that mm -hmm. that is probably no shock to my listeners. Uh, but the idea of like a coffee shop where they're making the coffee really well, where the seats are comfortable, where the place is clean, but artistic intention has been put into it. This relates, I think, strongly to like how cafe culture works. It would be a familiar experience to go into a local coffee shop and to see art on the wall, to see maybe books that you could pick up and buy or just pick up and take like a neighborhood library, you will probably find some unique color designs in there. Many of these elements say that outsider elements are welcomed and encouraged here. Mm -hmm. Art that maybe doesn't make very much money <laughs> is valued here. Literature, again, maybe that doesn't make very much money is part of what's valued here. And so this is a very welcoming space. It says the business storms that are outside that maybe drive this town aren't necessarily what's happening here. And these are all visual signals that tell you that this space works differently than the AT&T shop down the way or the realty office that maybe you work in on the other side of the street. Yeah. I think there's this idea of spaces we sometimes call welcoming is that welcoming sort of like doesn't actually capture what it is. It's who you are is valued here. So one of the things that I do with my students, when I have freshman students, I like them to talk about, well, what do people wear on campus? And they will tell me, well, on campus, you wear t-shirts and shorts or jeans or maybe tights. And that's about it. And I say, well, that's a very strong norm. Um, uh -huh. and, and then I ask them to tell me like, well, how does that relate to this idea that you were telling me earlier this term that we are all individuals and we like to express ourselves in unique ways, but yet we all show up wearing jeans, shorts, and t-shirts every day. But there are spaces like you're talking about where those norms are consciously lifted so you can present yourself in different ways. Yeah. 
So, so much work that I've done with cultures and companies, and then also in brands and creating consumer experiences, is the idea that they say they care about a certain value, but then inside of the workplace and out with the consumer, it's actually not reinforced, mm -hmm. right? They're not telling the right stories. They're not doing the right actions. They're not creating the right spaces. Like college campuses, you can be anything you want to be, be creative every day, be yourself. But the only stories we're going to tell is these two athletes and this really, really rich alumni. Everybody is going to dress the same and our spaces are going to be incredibly, incredibly boring. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so whenever I'm teaching classes, I always try to upend that, right? So the very first thing we're doing is we're teaching stories where the students of my past students who are only like 23 and now succeeding, here's their stories. We're going to interpret the concepts, not through the most famous examples from companies. It's not just going to be Disney. It's going to be your favorite musical artist. We're going to take actions and you're going to create things in the class and we're going to even modify the spaces. So in some of my first classes will actually hang things from the ceiling and it will just make the, the room entirely different. This is the value that we have here and the stories, actions, and space is going to create that moral temperature. Yeah. And that takes a lot of work for you to develop that in the classroom. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. So in thinking about applications of this and thinking about other spaces where moral temperatures are created, we have to mention musical artists. So whether it's uh, Taylor Swift and the friendship bracelets that are in that uh, audience, or whether it's a punk rock band like Rancid with their lines like, if you're going to fall down, I'm going to pick you back up again, right? The idea that we're going to be really aggressive in the pit, but we're also going to, you know, nobody gets hurt in the pit. This is a friendship thing. We're coming for this. And it's just so interesting how bands model or take things that fans are doing and just exaggerate into these moral spaces. You know far more about <laughs> the music scene now yeah. than I do. But my general take is that popular music either emphasizes or reacts to, discards political morals of the time. And so, I mean, when I look around what's happening in the world politically right now, I see a bunch of strong men or women that are leaning towards political systems that I don't really value. And what I see happening in the art and music world is often systems that are put up that are in direct opposition to that to suggest that there are other ways of creating actual space for people to live that's very different than the political climate that we have. Yeah. And uh, whether you are a Swifty or not, functionally, if we think about this moral temperatures, we're going to come in, we're going to have a bunch of stories. Those mm -hmm. are Taylor's stories about being successful and being emotional, but it's also stories about what her, her fans have done. So she's really good at modeling, especially back in the day, this singular fan did something I like. It's awesome. I'm going to spend a lot of time appreciating this as a way to norm set, moral temperature set for what I want. These are the types of actions. Uh, and then I'm going to create the greatest space ever with the Eras Tour for you all to come and share friendship bracelets and love yourself. Yeah. Same things happens with the little monsters. So yeah. Yeah. Lady Gaga's tour. I went to the first time the Monster Ball ever came to what was then called the Staples Center. Mm -hmm. That was still like when being a little altsy and freaky and nerdy and that type of stuff was really different. And so being in that felt just like this victory for all these weird kids that we were with lightning bolts on our faces and other much more provocative outfits. I think uh, I, yeah, I walked out of my Disney office and put on a lightning bolt and went to be a slightly different moral temperature that day. One of the things that I'm like really fascinated with is that depending on which theme parks people go to, people will dress in a way that aligns themselves with the IP from that company. There's something that's clicking in people's heads that say that's saying, hey, we're going into a space and we're going to dress in a way that aligns ourselves with that space for the day. So, you know, go put on your bolt and go. Yeah, <laughs> get on your bolt and go. And I think that that sort of how can we when we're designing different spaces, think about how can we present enough stories, present enough actions and provide the space where people are going to come into it and be able to appreciate and engage with that moral temperature? Let's uh, talk about Nike. Both of us have done some work at the Nike campus. When we're thinking about spaces, how is it constructed? Many of the buildings will have memorabilia, photos from different games, from individual athletes. And this is a way of of pointing to that these values matter here. These types of environments are most powerful when they're visual and less textual. If you have artifacts, photos, um, if 
the room is dressed in a certain way that suggests that stories of competition matter here, that that I think is more influential because people will absorb it slowly. They'll, they'll digest the experience. There's this little dance here to create a space in which what you want is suggested through visual stimuli, but not necessarily stated or overstated in that bad sense. So one of my favorite things talking to you about has been the idea of why Disney gets things wrong sometimes. And not just that because it's a financial pressure or some shock to the market, that there is something missing sometimes in the approaches. There's a number of reasons. You know, all companies have hits and misses. Yes. And so I think there's a couple of disconnects. One of the recent disconnects is that I don't think that some executives at Disney in the last five or 10 years really understand why or how deep fans were attracted to or using their products and experiences. Sometimes people don't actually understand completely why people are enjoying the things, right? Mm -hmm. There's a focus. They must enjoy this thing because it's a thrill. They must enjoy this thing just because it's the IP they like. And that sometimes there's this missing of something more abstract, like moral temperature that is actually drawing people to it. I also think that the overall clientele for the park, that that profile has changed yeah. in the last 20 or 30 years. And so when you had like truly mass entertainment, like cable TV, you had people kind of cycle through experiences altogether. And now what I see is a very tribal version of America in which there's groups that will go to the universal parks, or there's groups that will go to the national parks, or there's groups that will go to the Disney parks. But each of those groups is now smaller, but will frequent the things that they like more often. And so that's a different way of thinking about who's actually participating in these experiences. Yeah. And also is another reason why moral temperature might be so important, right? If you think of the world or America as divided into smaller groups and consumer audiences or fandoms, that fandom wants to go to some place and experience what it cares about. And what it cares about is also sometimes a reinforcement of even that it is a group. And so moral temperature just becomes more and more important than maybe it was in the 90s where Disney was this entertainment experience that was going for everyone. Yeah. So if you think about the 90s, let's say, since you're bringing up the 90s, do you remember Jingles? Do you remember... My baloney has a first name. It's OSC. That's not how advertising really works right now. Uh -huh. It's become far more granular. And so jingles aren't important anymore because you don't have that type of access to a, a nationally cohesive audience. And so you have a much smaller, more granular audience. And that's, that's how we identify ourselves is in these small groups as opposed to one homogenous national personality. And so the Disney parks. I think they're doing very well in terms of money and bringing people in. But the country is not about moving people through all the experiences. It's far more about people identifying with a core set of experiences that matter to them and then repeating those experiences or identifying with those experiences at a higher frequency than they used to 30 years ago. And so the jingles no longer valuable because you don't have access to that. But the viral web marketing that targets specific groups is very valuable right now because that's how we identify ourselves in smaller groups as opposed to larger national groups. And when people love something as Instagram or TikTok can prove, they will just consume snippets of the same thing over and over and over and over. So many Disney food posts, new updates from an Imagineer, new meme from a Disney character. And they're looking at like 20 to 25 pieces of content of Disney every day. Similar thing for sports, similar things mm -hmm. if you're video games. And this idea that we are people that are becoming obsessed or, or focused on these singular entities that sort of represent certain stories and morals that we want to engage in. Yeah, so we've become also very nomadic in America. Um, people live in different cities, probably many different cities, you know, their entire life. But this idea of fandom or relating to certain entertainment experiences is something that's very portable and allows people to have 
connections through those different physical environments that they've lived in over many, many years. Right. So in 2024, fandom is just so essential. Just if you are going to be a brand for the most part, and you're going to be loved, it's going to be through a deep sense of fans who have community with each other and are coming together through you in a way that is far different than just everybody watching American Idol. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that's also part of how we understand ourselves and how we understand our relationships to other people. I think if we go back to the 1950s, this is something that religious identities used to provide us mm -hmm. with, that there was a certain allegiance to religious stories and religious values. I see a drawing down of that in America in the last 70 years. And there's other things that are filling that space in part. And I think some of the things that are filling that space in part are different narratives that rise up out of, out of entertainment. So in some... If we think about this from a historical perspective, which is what Todd J. Pierce is always doing, there's this lessening of certain types of communities or home stories or locality that we used to derive something from. And now what is often filling that is something that is owned by a company. And so what those things deliver to us need to be somewhat different than they were in the past. And a huge thing that, that they can sometimes deliver us is this space that we can go and feel this amazing moral temperature. Absolutely. This podcast is part of Hiduk House. If you like this original and powerful idea, you may also want to check out these other ideas. First, you might want to listen or re-listen to the podcast episode on portals. That episode is all about creating distinct spaces and mindsets from the first moment a person enters a space. Speaking of podcasts, you should check out the Disney History Institute podcast hosted by Todd J. Pierce. His What Theme Parks Give Us episodes are the ones most directly related to moral temperature, but I also recommend the other episodes and his books as they are all full of unique historical perspectives rendered with the skill of a precise academic who has the flair of a fiction writer. Second, you might want to read at HeiduKhaus.com some of the white paper books I've written on values and spaces, including Welcome to Team Hero, which is a model for reaching new and resistant audiences and relates to how to welcome people into a new space and make it one they will want to stay in and embrace. Finally, you may also want to visit OYF.com, where my colleagues at On Your Feet and I write a lot about creating values in organizations through stories, using tools such as the Story Plotter and the Values to Action Framework that have impacted many organizational and university cultures such as Nike, Disney, Microsoft, Oregon, Colorado, Cal Poly, and many more. There you'll also find a number of case studies. Thanks for listening. My name is Troy Hadu Campbell, and I created Hadu House to engage with the most interesting ideas and the most interesting people, always with a scientific mind and an artistic heart approach.